Well, as I, start, as I said before the tape ended, we were heading, they let us go back into uh, Pango Pango there to get some fuel and uh, mainly food. We had fuel, I guess. We had mainly food and stuff because we were out. We had been supplying a couple of destroyers all this time, and they cleaned out all of our lockers that morning. We didn't have a thing left in any of our fresh stuff. And we'd been giving uh, goodies to these. When these destroyers come up alongside, uh, we'd give them food. We also would always send over a couple of... Uh, uh, Ten-gallon cans of ice cream because we had an ice cream maker aboard ship, so then they loved it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we were out of everything. So we got to uh, Pango Pango. Uh, they worked. Uh, they restocked us up there in a matter of just a few hours, and we uh, were able to uh, get back and join up the force again. Well, on, our, on our previous trip to Pango Pango, we did get one uh, one hour, one or two hour liberty. I think we got to go ashore and. Uh, the uniform were whites, and it was so sticky and so humid down there that anybody that had a tattoo just showed right through the uniform. It was so <laughs> so sticky. I I was ashore there for about oh about an hour, and that was enough to suit me, I'll tell you. <laughs> but uh, we did still get our our mail though. Our our seaplanes would fly into the harbor there and would land and pick up uh, uh, mail and whatnot and bring it out. And one time there, there was a storm going on, and you've heard of water spouts. Well, we actually saw several. It was like flying through a forest, these water spouts. They were dodging them and everything, but they were like a, hurricane, like a tornado at sea, I guess. But they uh, didn't hit us anyway. They didn't hit it. But I'll go back a little retrograde a little bit more, but the harbor there was so calm. There was no wind. It was right, right near the equator, no, no trade winds there. And that harbor was just like glass. Well, our seaplanes couldn't get off without a little bit of help. So they'd run all the whale boats and motor boats and stuff out there and create a little bit of chop. And then they could get a little bouncing, and then they'd get airborne. Well, one plane would not get off the water no matter what they did. So they brought it back aboard ship, and they found out that its gas tank had been leaking into the float. So the float had about 110 gallons of gas in it, which was a lot of weight, so that's why she wouldn't get off. So we spent the rest of the day siphoning all that gas out of there and putting it in cans. And that night, after we got out away from everything, they were back there uh, with a specially axe that would not create a spark. They were made, I guess, of bronze or something. And they, would, they would take that can and they'd whack a hole in it and throw it over the side. And so they got rid of all that 110 gallons of high test gas. But it was. Uh, and I mentioned earlier about the how we got fueled up with the uh, from oil from the tankers and whatnot. One time we were all hooked up and pumping oil, and the ships pulled apart too much and ruptured one of the lines. So that quick, I mean, a heck of a noise. Uh, but there's a guy standing watch right over there, and he had that valve closed that quick. But I mean, that thing probably shot out a thousand gallons in a couple of seconds, and when he it shut off, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's how they fueled us. <laughs> And with gas and uh, uh, oil and well, sometimes some food stuff, but mostly just just mail and that sort of thing. Or personnel. Sometimes they'd have something they had to come aboard ship. They run them across in the breachers, boy, you know. And they'd be they'd be dragging them across, and the ships would go to get also go down. He'd get wet, you know. <laughs> so it was. Uh, How close were the ships? Like oh, miles? they were probably. Uh, I am estimating now 50 to 60, maybe that many. I don't know. One time I know some kind of ways through together. One, we actually did bump. One time one destroyer came in and bumped, came up and actually uh, come up underneath one of our gun shields and kind of bent it up a bit. But, uh, but uh, all kinds of things can happen. Like one time at Pearl, this is before the war now, back again I'm retrograding, we had a repair ship alongside. They were welding up all the portholes. And we were, why they, and it was kind of stupid because the uh, gasoline barge came alongside and was putting, was filling our gasoline tanks and they overfilled them. And they, so that goes out into the harbor. And here was this gasoline on the water and the welders right above it. All of a sudden, instant fire between the ships. Well, I happened to be, uh, one of my, my duty at that time on a fire was, was the uh, fulmite hose. So I go by the uh, full match, they'd hand me the hose, and the guys behind would, would each grab the connection. Because you couldn't drag them through those through the hatches, they'd hang up. So there'd be a guy there, you'd have 50 feet between you and the guy behind you. So we 
started dumping that stuff in harmony, forced that fire on out away from the ships. The repair ship got burned up pretty good on the side, but we survived. But uh, again, a humorous thing in a way. One night, about midnight, the fire alarm went off. I get up, they hand me the nozzle. The fire was in the, was in the butcher shop, which was just forward of the hangar. So we go zooming in there, and just I get there, and the guys were making up the foam. They knew how many lengths of hose to put on, then they couple the thing on and start making foam. So I got to the uh, butcher shop, the guy said, oh, okay, it's all out, it's all out. Well, the foam got there just at that moment. <laughs> Comes out about that big around, you know. <laughs> So he grabs her nozzle, tries to push it down, hold it again. Well, time they got the word back that I couldn't make it. He had about 100 gallons of foam in the butcher shop. What a mess. <laughs> was oh, yeah. yeah, but that was, that was just life aboard ship. I mean, never, like they say, never a dull moment on that thing. It was always something going on. But, uh, well, let's see, where were we? Oh, we came back from, uh, after we left Pango Pango, we joined back up with the task force, heading back to Pearl. and. We had about two more or three days to go to get in. And we were actually at sea, 76 days that trip. And without stopping, except for our quick little stops at Pango twice, okay. Wars came aboard ship to ship one. Aviation radio was second class back to San Diego to form Torpedo Squadron 10. Well, I was the only one they had. So I had instant orders to leave the ship. We got back to Pearl. Uh, I did. I was transferred off the ship, went to their receiving ship, which at that time was temporary barracks right there. And we didn't know what we were going to go on yet, uh, how we are going to get back to the States. So they had us working on various details. And one of the uh, details I recall very vividly was they had, they had about 30 of us. They took us over onto the battleship California that I had seen sinking. They were they had brought her up part way, and they were still bringing her up. And they had us down in in the decks that had been underwater, right by that number one forward turret, cleaning up the mess and everything that was there. And all the electrical stuff had emanated white goo all over everything. We had to clean up all that mess and all the tools we could find were there. And one guy picked up a shoe and it still had a foot in it. I mean, it was sort of grim. That was a day I'll never forget. I got back to our receiving ship, and the, the clothes I'd worn that day, I didn't bother. They just went, uh, they were so full of grease and oil and mess, and I just got rid of them. But we did that for, then another day worked at the, uh, uh, let's see what it was. I guess it was the uh, supply dock. And they had us working in, in the, uh, <clears throat> where they have all that frozen food and stuff. They had us going in there and making up orders for various ships and things. So we had, had heavy clothing on everything and that. It was sub-zero in there, I know, but uh, that's where I met this friend of mine that we became real buddies. So he was also a radio man and he was being shipped back. So, but one day I was put on a detail, it was a Saturday and I was put on this detail over at the submarine base. And it turned out that I was, became a gardener. I was clipping the weeds and pulling weeds and clipping the lawn and doing this and everything. Pretty soon I hear somebody walking up behind me and this, this guy stops and starts talking, and I turn around and realize, oh, he was <laughs> a captain or an admiral, big, big. <laughs> and I get up and salute quick like, oh, don't worry, just carry on, carry on. You're, he said, you're pretty like you're enjoying this. I said, oh, yeah, I said, sure, sure beats the heck out of being shot at and everything. He said, well, would you like to be here permanently? <laughs> I said, well, really, no, sir. I'm, uh, you know, I, I couldn't see being a gardener the rest of my life. <laughs> But he was very nice. They told me, you know, if the captain or the admiral comes down, I'd be sure to, you know, just salute him in, as I did. So I almost got myself into the garden work there. Later on, I mean, maybe I wish I had, but uh, anyway. Uh, all kinds of little things happen to you like that. Well, one day they had a score. It was a Saturday, I believe. The next day I went over. They had a bunch of score to the Lurling, which was the Matson team that had just arrived with uh, several thousand troops. Navy people and Army people, and I guess they were one heck of a seasick bunch because that ship was a mess. Other than all those big promenade decks, they had erected uh, bunks and whatnot, hammocks, uh, not hammocks, but the regular bunks about three to four high on all those decks and inside everywhere. Well, we spent the whole day cleaning up this mess, and so <clears throat> 
they told us, okay, you guys get to go back on the early to the States. So next day we went aboard Lurley and this buddy that I had met, we were sitting there talking and the guy he knew came along and he uh, said, hey, he says, uh, here's a detail, you guys want to volunteer? Well, we learned then not to volunteer for anything. But he said, oh, he said, this, this, this you'll enjoy. Okay, so we did finally. It turned out what we would do, we'd go down to the uh, chow hall where they served the food we set up the steam tables and dish out the uh, food to uh, any uh, to uh, the Army or Navy people who were on board, secure that, and then we were off the rest of the time until the next meal. So we didn't, everybody else had to stand watches and had to get up on the weather decks and, and do all kinds of duties and things. Well, we had it, we, we were living high on the log, I'll tell you, eat all we could, all we wanted. I mean, none of us were sick or anything. But the first couple of meals out, though, I mean, there were hardly anybody there because <laughs> so many people were sick. Now, they had about 2,000 women and children on there. Mostly the women were pregnant and sort of thing. They were all being shipped back to the States. They were all dependents and things. And they had about uh, uh, 200 Navy and several hundred Army on board that were being shipped back. Well, we had the best duty on the ship, so, so. Well, the night before we got into San Francisco, they said, well, we want to get rid of this ice cream. Well, they had tons and tons of ice cream bars. We were giving them away everywhere. We were just trying. We'd, we'd see some kids here have it. We'd give them a whole carton of 12 or 24 ice cream bars. <laughs> oh, God, we had roast duck. We had everything on that ship. It was really a, a chow hound on that thing. Well, the night before we uh, got in the Golden Gate there, they called us down to the uh, purser's office. I see you guys, let's see, you were here uh, four and a half. Uh, okay. They paid each one of us. Two dollars a day <laughs> for all that work we had done. <laughs> so he's got eleven dollars, I think. <laughs> well, next morning uh, the uh, Golden Gate opened up and let us in. By then, they had submarine nets clear across the uh, gate there, and they had the you know, the blimps were barrage balloons, what they call them, were drifting around, and they escorted us in, you might say. And we came under the Golden Gate and ended up down there at the uh, came into the uh, pier. And <clears throat> nobody knew what was going on. But my buddy and I, we already had our sea bags all strapped up and roped up like they're supposed to be. And we saw uh, some deckhands down there getting ready to put a ladder up against the side of the ship. So we said, hey, we, <laughs> we opened that big door, opened that big door ourselves. And they, uh, we signaled up, okay, they put the thing right there. So my buddy and I, we just went right on down the ladder and off the ship. We were traveling with independent orders, so we didn't have anything to worry about anybody else, see? So we got to the end of the, of the pier there and dropped our sea bags right there. In those days, you could trust things. Things didn't disappear. Went a couple of blocks down the street to the YMCA, because I knew my, a friend of mine that I had, uh, a friend of my father's, he was uh, in transportation business before the war, and the Navy had him doing uh, transportation things. So when he said, what are you guys doing? And I told him, I said, well, we just came on the Lurley. Oh? We didn't know nothing about it. It was so secret. I said, well, you got a problem. He said, you have a couple thousand women over there, and you got about six or eight hundred army, and you got a couple hundred navy, and nobody knows what the heck to do. So he got right on the phone, and he called the Red Cross, everything else, get them going. And then he called over to the navy base over there. He said, hey, check in so-and-so, my as having reported in and gone on liberty, and oh, give him, give him a week's delay in reporting in San Diego. <laughs> And I said, hey, my, my buddy here, too. So he fixed him up also. He had to go to New York, but he got a week's delay report, too. Meantime, I got to a telephone, phoned my folks. It was just across the bay there. And as it had turned out, my fiance uh, was living with them then because the people, the guardians that she'd been living with, uh, that gal had kind of gone fruitcake, so she was living with my folks. So, of course, they came over and they brought her along. And, and uh, so we... That's how we got together again. Well, that night, uh, her name was Sybil, S-Y-B-I-L, by the way. Uh, we decided now's the time. So next day we went to our normal church that we went to and talked to the priest afterwards and said, can you arrange a wedding in a heck of a hurry? Oh, yeah, anytime. Okay, we'll let you know. 
We hadn't even talked to our folks yet. Got home from church, then we blew the then we blew, blew the bubbles. Uh, how soon we can get our marriage license and everything else? Well, we're going to get married this week. Well, they called her folks. And they lived over in San Francisco. So, meantime, Sybil and I and his friend, we went visiting a few of her friends and my friends. Came back, and her father was there then. See, well, technically, I should you know be asking him permission to marry his daughter. See, okay. Every time I tried to get along with him, everybody else would gather around. They knew what was going on. See, <laughs> funny, and he was just about he was smoking the pipe. He was about twisted that pipe apart. <laughs> well, finally, I burst, I burned out. It. Okay, I want to get married. Okay, well, he gave me a little talk for a while. Well, I hope you can do this. This is funny. And he gave me a little lecture. He said, "Well, okay, fine, so good." So believe it or not, they phoned their friends. My folks phoned their friends, and next day Monday we went up to the courthouse there in San Rafael. And it just happened that uh, Charlie McCrum, who was the uh, county clerk, or so we would call him, uh, his wife, Muriel, had been my algebra teacher in high school all those years. So well, Charlie knew me, of course, a well back, knew my dad, because he'd been in the American Legion uh, commander at one time. And What do you need? And I told him, he said, oh, okay. So he got the papers filled out. He says, uh, he said, you know, he said, they, they got this three-day law. You're supposed to wait three days. But let me see. We'll go and see Judge Butler. Up to see the judge. He told the judge, he said, you know, he, he might be transferred out here before he can do anything. The judge waived this three-day waiting period. So technically you had to take the blood test and get the get the results back and then wait three days or something. Well, they, they waived all that. But we'd already gone over early that morning and I'd had my blood test and she'd had her blood. So but the results of course weren't in yet. So he said, okay. So he rolls up favorite hands. That very, that very day, and he said, he said, for God's sake, don't get married until Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. So by God, Thursday night came, and that little church of ours was packed. <laughs> it was really packed. Good. And I had to be married in uniform. Uh, at the time I had, my, I was then a second class aviation railman, and uh, so we were married in the, in the little church there, and my brother. Uh, who was then living nearby or working nearby, they, they had drafted him back into the Forest Service because the Japs had sent some submarines over, or some of the, some of the balloons of theirs had come over in, and uh, they had him up there in the fire. So he uh, he'd already applied to get in the Navy and go to flight school. So they, he'd been accepted. So about a few weeks later, he actually went... Uh, went into the uh, flight training. But, uh, so we got married. <laughs> went over to, uh, <clears throat> after the ceremony, <clears throat> oh, a good friend of mine, uh, his mother, he was in Annapolis, by the way, at that time, just getting out. Uh, I had on this Navy thing, you know, she pulls back my collar and dumps a whole pound of rice down inside my neck, you know. <laughs> well, when, <clears throat> when uh, Sylvia and I got down, after we, her father put on a little, a little thing for us there, and when we got left there, went down to San Francisco, down to the hotel there, and uh, everywhere we walked, I left a trail of rice behind. You know? <laughs> so we registered in, and the uh, let's see. So we did, 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 did uh, let's see, honeymoon, yeah, 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 and so forth. Uh, I had those few days though. So, I didn't have to be down to San Diego. That was Thursday night, so I didn't have to get down to San Diego until Monday. So some friends of ours had uh, given us the keys to their little cabin up on the Russian River. So we went up there Friday morning, and we had there Friday and then Saturday. Uh, we went over and got my brother and took him to a show and that sort of thing, and then back. And Sunday morning, we had to drive back down to Mill Valley and got with the folks. And then this friend that I told you about, his transportation, he gave us transportation over to uh, the uh, bus station there, when I had to go across the bridge to, I was going down by the by the train. Uh, the uh, Santa Fe train ran up from Oakland up, and then down the San Joaquin, Sacramento Valley rather. So we bid adieu at that point, and then I got down to uh, L.A. 
had to take the bus from Bakersfield on over because the train took a real long route to get over. So finally got down to San Diego about seven o'clock that morning and <clears throat> went over to Fort Island, or went over to North Island, it's called down there. And I got, or got a ride down to the hangar and I checked in there and the chief was just, uh, the chief Mick, where was, he was the chief in charge of all the, he was taking the muster of all the people there. Well, as soon as I came in here, I had this radio crow and everything going on. All these ERSAT radio, but they were to be all spotted at. Man, they were clustered around me like, like bees in a honey hive, you know? <laughs> and the chief said, who are you? And I told him, I had my papers. Oh, stay there, don't move, stay right there. I did. He got all done taking the muster, and he grabbed me, he says, oh, he took me up to see the skipper, who was the pilot, Colette. And he says, oh, I'm glad you're here. I thought for a minute I was in trouble because I had been, uh, you know, uh, a week's delay in reporting, see. The skip, this quarter had just been uh, inaugurated or activated about a week before that, see. So, well, he says, we're getting a new plane, a new torpedo plane just coming out of the Grumman factory. We don't have any here yet, but they're coming. Uh, we've got uh, 36 boot radiomen around radio school. You're going to train them to become aviation radiomen. You're going to continue with your gunnery. And oh, by the way, our plane has a Norden bomb site, so you're going to go to bombardier school too. I said, sir, yeah, I just got married last Thursday. He said, well, that's your problem. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, routine became quite evident. I was working with these guys. We set up a table with lots of keys, and headphones, so the guys could still learn more code, which we thought they had to use. Turned out later they didn't. Uh, radio gear and so forth and so on. And a plane came in. They took it up to the shop, decided they're going to tear it all down and make a catalog out of it. So I got stuck with that duty, and I was up there for a couple of weeks, completely tearing out all the electrical and all the radio stuff. I laid it out on big boards, putting labels on it, and then taking pictures from overhead of this thing. That all became operating in, in the operating manual, these pictures. That plane was so new they hadn't done this yet. See. In the meantime, all the orders that kept coming up for instant changes to be made. The book was that thick just to make changes on the planes. Well, that went on for a week, a couple of weeks before we got that all squared away. Had all the radio equipment categorized, what have you. Then <clears throat> we did get a plane in to fly. Okay, so the uh, XO uh, grab me says, we're going to go fly. Okay. I'd never been in a plane before, and neither had the gunner, and neither had he. So it was kind of a new experience. So we get out on, on the uh, North Island there, get on the runway and get ready to take off. Got the green light to go. About halfway down the, down the strip, just about ready to round up, uh, there was a big crash. And I look out the little porthole and the right wing was gone. Just completely gone. There was just a bunch of material fluttering there. Well, the pilot brought her under control, stopped there. I thought we'd ground loop or something, but no. I, I climbed out, and the gunner came down the turret, and he was white as a sheet. I said, Steve, what's the matter? A P-38 was still landing. Now, that darn P-38 had been, had failed to land a couple of times, and was given a wave off, but he came in anyway. Now, all I can figure is that his left wheel must have hit our wingtip which broke it off. But if he'd landed right on top of us, there would have been a big flash and a big fire because we were carrying a full load of gas. So that was my first experience with a torpedo plane. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, we got more planes in before long, and it was becoming a daily procedure then. We were going, uh, every day we would ride on this uh, bombardier training thing where, where you'd ride along, and you were up there about, 10 feet off the deck with a bomb sight, and the bug was a little uh, thing that was motorized. It could go in circles and do anything, and that was your target. So you got to where you could learn to run the bomb sight, and the uh, guy that ran that thing would, would put a, a dime or a quarter on there, and if you could hit that, then you got to keep it, see? Well, I got a lot, quite a few quarters that way. I got fairly decent at <laughs> shooting that thing. 
And <clears throat> then we would go out every day or so uh, with a load of uh, practice bombs and go out over Salton Sea and drop in a big uh, pylon target out there. Uh, if you look at Salton Sea from the air, it's, it's uh, on the west side, there's kind of a point that comes out. And just off that point is where that uh, target was about 60 foot triangle of white, made up of white slats and things, you could see it. And we'd come in anywhere from 10 to 12 to 15, 18,000 feet and drop the uh, bombs on that and then uh, see how close you came and everything. Well, one day when I got out there, I opened up the bomb bay, the bombs were gone. <laughs> I don't know where we lost them. <laughs> Somewhere between there, we didn't have any bad reports from San Diego. <laughs> Evidently, uh, they were, the shackles or something had been triggered, so they were all released, and they were laying on the door. The minute the doors opened, they just spilled out. So, so what? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, after day in and day out of that practice, uh, we were doing radio practice, bombardering practice, uh, everything, and then we actually dropped some torpedoes out there in the ocean there. Uh, they had uh, they didn't have the, the warheads on them, but they had the regular heads. Uh, we would drop them, and uh, then uh, they had some some old destroyers and things out there that we were shooting at, and they had them set so they go way below underneath them there. But those those torpedoes that first came out in those days were not very dependable. And one day we dropped ours, and when it hit the water, it made a three sixty right there. But that was just enough delay to where it went dead center under the destroyer. <laughs> well, a lot of times they'd, they'd go in, they'd never come up, they'd go hit the bottom, I guess. But when they got to the end of their run, five or six miles down the pike, they would come to a float, they'd start and they'd float with a head, and then a smoke bomb would go off to the market, and they'd recover it, because those torpedoes were worth about 10,000 bucks, $1940. And they would recover them and then fire them up and use them again. But uh, at that time it was interesting too because some B-25s were being f fitted out with torpedoes, one under each wing. They were planning those to use up there in the, the Aleutians. So those Army pilots were right in line with us. They were falling right behind. We'd drop, then they'd drop. And they had two to drop, see. And that was that was during uh, May and June of uh, 42. Well, <clears throat> as time went on, uh, we got these Raylan pretty well trained. And I'd already been in second class for six months or so. And I was ready to go up for first class, which would be like an E6, today's ratings. And the radio officer didn't really know anything about radio at all, so he'd do. I said, hey, you make up the test for the third class and the second class. So I did. I made up a test. And I wondered what, who, what was going to be my test. So when I got in there to take the test, guess what? I got the second and the third class. The test I would made up was my test. <laughs> so obviously I cooled it. Because <laughs> I knew the answers of all. <laughs> Just took a little longer to fill out the answers. But So I became first class on the 1st of July, 1942. So my folks came down to make a quick visit. We told them we had a surprise for them, so when they showed up, they didn't know uh, what it was going to be, because uh, my wife had taken a real liking to avocados, and she was eating them about three times a day and put on quite a bit of weight. <laughs> so when they get right, they thought, well, she was pregnant. <laughs> but no. <laughs> well, our, all things came to a good end there. Uh, first of August or thereabouts, they said, OK, we're shipping you back out to uh, Kaneohe, which is on the eastern side of Oahu Island, because in the meantime, the uh, few battles had taken place, the Coral Sea battle, where we lost a carrier, the uh, Midway battle, where we lost the Yorktown, and originally, a gr air group would be set up and it would be attached to a particular ship. That's what we were called, Torpedo Squadron 10. We had a fighter group, scouting group, and bombing group, and torpedo group. And we had 12 to 15 planes, 
torpedo planes, and they had the fighters. The total plane complement was about 75 planes for a ship. But since they had lost the York Tower at Midway, and the, uh, oh boy, it escapes me right now which ship was lost at Coral Sea. They changed the situation around where instead of an air group signed to a given carrier, every carrier ended up with three air groups. You had one training, fighting, and then recovering and reassigning. So when we got out to Pearl for our uh, last training there, that's when they suddenly threw this uh, radar at us. At that moment, none of, our, none of our planes had radar. And I don't know what, our skipper pulled some, some uh, strings or something. So we ended up with a plane that had radar in it. And that was one of the earliest miles off the production line because it had controls in the second cockpit where they installed the radar. Every morning, he, he or one of the other pilots would take me over to Fort Island where the school was. I went to a special one-man school I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. Everybody, all my guys thought I was goofing off somewhere. And we learned how to use that radar. And it, it actually it did, you could tell. And they tested me like I had it. They'd have the left and the right antennas crossed up. You could tell right away, you just correct the thing. And none there, okay, then came the next episode where I almost bought it. We got up on these, on these radar hops and just after we took off, I smelled, smelled ghastly, really strong. I looked out, it was about two inches floating around my feet. And I picked up the microphone and see this. I guess I can be safe with that mic, no spark gets out of it. And I called the pilot and said, I don't know what we got gasoline floating around down here. Be careful. So he just put the plane in a real slow turn, came right back in and landed, came up to the flight line, and the mech was standing there, what's the matter, what's the matter? He still had the gas cap in his hand for the inside tank. Skipper said, that's the matter. That guy got demoted down to nothing instantly. Just like the one that previously started up the plane when his big signs all over the sticks said, do not start, because they didn't have the exhaust pipes back on the plane. But he started anyway. Well, he burned down a firewall, and it was a, a, all of a sudden a lot of smoke. He likewise got demoted to nothing in a hurry, too. <laughs> so there's another another time that I almost bought the bullet, but uh, it can happen, you know. And you never wonder why. Well, well, on the 16th of October, we well we did a few more practice things. We made a uh, practice bombing uh, trip on uh, Maui one day, and we landed after that. All the pilots all ran off to the officers' club, and we were left to our own devices, so we all went down to the beer garden for lunch. Well, they had a rule that we could only have two bottles at a time, so we each had our little carry case thing. So both Steve and I got back to the plane with, with a, literally a six-pack of bottles in our, in our little thing, got back to the plane. We learned, we had to learn also how to start the plane and have the engine running, so we got, I got the engine running, and... Uh, the pilot came and we got we got underway and got up in the air and we went up to 18,000 feet. In the meantime, we were sipping this beer. Priest and Steve taps me on the shoulder, down on the head, and he says, hey, pass me the relief tube. I said, well, you know that damn thing don't work. That thing goes outside the plane just in front of a foot hatch. If you use it, then all that stuff comes back inside, gets down there, and then boils, see? I, I got an idea. So I took my dikes and I cut that damn tube off where it was there and went back where the little hatch there is underneath my 30 caliber tunnel gun. I opened that up and s put a couple of feet of that tube out there. And, oh, it worked beautifully, see. So I tapped, come on down and use the tube. Oh, never mind, I use the bottles. I said, okay, give me the bottles. Oh, and I threw them out. My God, we were flying step down formation, which meant there was three of us like this, another guy right below us. Well, we got aboard ship. <laughs> Pilot comes up to us and says, you guys must have been having quite a party up there. Yeah, he said, I was dodging bottles. Well, the skipper heard about it, so he came up and kind of, you know, kind of talked to us seriously a few minutes. But he didn't, uh, 
He didn't court martial or do anything. He could have, really, but he didn't. And when the other pilot comes and says, hey, I saw something under your plane flopping loose. I thought I'd go up and see what the trouble was. And every time I got up close to my windshield fogged up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was some of the humor we had at the time. But, well, <laughs> on the 16th, we flew aboard with all our baggage and everything. The ship was on the way back out to do battle. We uh, went down and we <clears throat> we crossed the uh, international date line again. I was already a, a, a sea salt, you might say. I'd already gone through the polywog status when I was on the San Francisco, and that damn near killed me too once. But because <laughs> I they caught me on fire, they had a, they had you all smeared up with paint. And God, it was all over your body, and and uh, the uh, my friend the radio and he had a. a Magneto in there, and every time somebody come along, he had a Magneto with a silver spoon with a wire on it. You'd come by there, he'd dangle that thing, and he'd be kicking his sharks there. Well, that caught caught me on fire. So they uh, <laughs> smothered that out and took me down the sick bay. <laughs> and so I guess he's had enough. So, I, <laughs> so that's, anyhow, that's how I uh, survived the crossing the equator there. And <clears throat> that was good. That was a lot of fun. You know, some of the ships didn't allow them to do it because it was kind of serious sort of thing. But uh, so when I was on the Enterprise there, they didn't even have any ceremonies then. We just just did it. But I was already uh, indoctrinated, you might say. So well, on the twenty fifth, which was a Sunday, uh, the Japanese fleet had been spotted by search planes, PBYs, or something. So uh, part of our squadron went out to uh, do battle. I was, unfortunately, I was had been in the sick bay because I had a heck of a headache, so they kept me in. They wouldn't let me out. They kept me in there for 24 hours, and I was there when this thing went on. And I didn't like the idea of being in the sick bay during a battle either, so I pulled every string I could to get out of there. So next morning, I was out. and. Uh, but that night, when those guys came back, it was dark. And most of those pilots had never made a night landing. So we lost a few planes that night. They were out of fuel. They came right up, almost landed, and then they just into the water. The destroyers were picking them up like gangbusters. And they only lost one man that night, I think. One of the, one of the radio ones just went into shock or something and didn't get out. But. Uh, so I was back with my normal pilot again, and that picture that I that I brought, one of the pictures I brought, shows a plane uh, taking off, getting ready to take off, but the guys holding the chalkboards. Well, that happens to be our squadron taking off, because this picture doesn't show the details. But the first time I saw that picture, the details show the the message that I memorized, which you you pass that data to the pilot, and he'd pass you any data that he had that you had to know, like. Uh, what our name was that day, what the ship's name was. Well, as, so we took off about 9 o'clock after everything else went off, and we had to run the entire length of that deck to get off. The smaller planes could get off in shorter distance, so they were parked up further. But we were right back by the fantail because we had to run the full length of that deck to get off, even with the ship doing top speed into the wind sort of thing. They didn't have the catapults they do nowadays, at that time anyway. Well, we got airborne, and we had to, uh, <clears throat> one problem was that uh, we had to fly, we had to follow some SBDs, which were slower, because they outranked our man, which was sort of funny, because we could have gotten much higher, much quicker. But we were following them, we were almost fishtailed to keep from running over them. And about that time, uh, we heard a message come in on the radio that uh, land on blue base or land on red base, one of the two, because something or other was damaged. And I didn't know which at that time. We had not exchanged. I didn't know which was blue and which was red. Well, just about that time, we were only about 5,000 feet. About that time, all of a sudden, uh, some uh, Japanese zeros came down out of the sun, and they nailed us right off. The plane went into a quiver and like this and started down. 
uh, smoke and stuff was, and bits of metal were flying past. So I knew damn well we were in trouble. I picked up the mic, called a pilot twice, no answer. Got the gunner down out of the turret. I clipped on my chute. We had emergency chutes, 26 footers. But the gunner would not wear his harness. It wasn't time enough to get it on. I'd already pulled the pin and kicked the door out. So he indicated it. So I did, I bailed out. And I didn't count to 10 and yell Geronimo like they said. I pulled the cord. It, un it spun out in a hurry and I went and blacked out. I didn't see it. I mean, just the shock of the opening just put me out for a few seconds or so. And when I came around, the first thing, the first thing you notice is you hear before you see. If you've ever been out, you'll find that out. Okay. I heard a funny noise, and when I could look, a damn zero was strafing me. My chute was suddenly developing a lot of holes that it didn't have before. So I played dead. I just went slack, and I hit the water. I wasn't very far up. There was a burning slick just a short distance away, which was evidently our plane, so I didn't have much time either. That's why the gunner didn't make it. Well, I get in the water, and I was all tangled up in the chute. The shrouds were all... I got out from that, and something was still pulling me down. I remember I had a mate west on live checks. I pulled the CO bottle. This one opened up. Pulled the left one. It was a dud. Thank God I pulled the right one first. But I was still being hauled down. I realized finally that one of those chutes was tied around my on my buckle, on my flight suit. I got that off and then, okay, then I was floating okay. And then I realized there was a dogfight going on right overhead. There was some of our fighter planes and some Zeros were still tangling it up. There was while some of their stray shells and what have you would hit the water near me. So I was ducking under the water. <laughs> well, pretty soon that ended up, there was, uh, I saw two of our planes, two or three of our fighter planes get shot down. And finally ended up with one of our planes and one of their planes and took off each each was smoking. <laughs> then it got real quiet. You can't believe how quiet quiet is until you're in that situation. I was two hundred miles from the nearest land except straight down. And I said to myself, What in the hell did you get yourself into now? So I found out in a hurry that the guy that designed that May West, I wished he had, he had been in that situation because it, it tries to hold you up like this, but my legs, well, I guess my back was really hurt from that jerk out. And I couldn't stand in that position very long. And then I had one side of Mae West was sick. So I bundled the whole thing up under my chin. And that kept me floating vertically. Which I think may have saved me. I want to have a little swig of this stuff here. Because the sharks normally like to go for things that resemble a, a seal or something like that. Well, me vertical in the water didn't mean as much. Well, that may have been what saved me, I don't know. But I did not get shark bit. And the two fighter pilots that went down nearby that I'd seen shot down, were in, they each had their little one-man rafts, and they, the sharks were swimming around them. So we knew they were there. Well, the day went on. There was I'd hear a plane, I'd look and see, and it was usually one of theirs. And late in the afternoon, I did see a PBY, but of course he was probably 10 miles away. So naturally, you don't see very well in this. Having been in a search condition, it's awfully hard to spot something in the water. Well, you live your whole life over and over again. And that's where I made the declaration that I wanted to see my 21st birthday. Now, as I said earlier, if you haven't figured it out, I was born on Leap Year Day. So at that point in time, I'd only had 10 birthdays. As I sit here today, 
I are now 82 and a half plus. I've got another year and a half or so before I see my 21st birthday. So that's a goal I'm working on <laughs> still. <laughs> well, it got dark. And of course, my watch had gone completely, salt water got into it. So I was telling time by the stars. I learned as a Boy Scout years before all the constellations in the northern and southern hemisphere. So as each constellation came up, I would know what time it was. Well, the night went on and on. And when you're in the water, when it's totally dark like that, you don't realize every time you moved, there were little organisms in the water that would fluoresce when you disturbed them. So every time you moved, you'd see this stuff floating around. So I tried not to move too much to attract any attention from anything. But every once in a while, a darn jellyfish would come nearby. And if you've ever been hit by a jellyfish, it hurts. They sting. Something bad. I mean, they brush against your face or your chin or something. Oh, they really, really burn you. Well, finally came sunrise. I was still there. Most beautiful sunrise, there were a few clouds. The sun was shining through with those, like the Japanese flag. And, well, here I are still. What's up now? <laughs> Didn't have much hope for anything, but I was still, where there's life, there's hope. <clears throat> Sometime later on, I noticed, happened to look over to the horizon, and I saw what looked like some sticks on the horizon. I thought, well, I was hallucinating. So I turned away and didn't wait. I'll look, later, I looked back a little later on, and by God, they were closer and they were moving. It was a whole doggone Jap battle fleet. Battle wagons, cruisers, destroyers, everything. Heading right in the right direction. As it turned out, they were making evasive squares, patterns, and I was right in the middle of one of their big squares. Well, I made the decision then that I would rather be picked up or put out of my misery because I could see no other solution. So every time I went up on a swell, I would kick up some white water I was darn well, there's probably 10,000 binoculars looking at me. <laughs> those big battleships, they had those huge, they call them pagoda towers. Those things went way up in the air. And I know darn well they could see me. Well, they kept going by, nobody was stopping. The cruisers were going by, and all of a sudden, a destroyer came around from this, damn near clipped this cruiser, came around, pulled up alongside, and threw on their brakes, and pulled up alongside and threw down an old dilapidated rope ladder. I mean, uh, well, I grabbed a hold, of it and I could. I was so exhausted, not exhausted, but just so weak by then from being in that water, I couldn't even climb. So I just hung on. They pulled me in the ladder up together, put me on the deck, and I just immediately crumpled right on the deck there. So they stripped off this flight suit I had, poured a bucket of fresh water on me, gave me a Japanese uh, coveralls type thing to wear, a real rough canvas, and that was it. Next thing I know, they had me in the, sitting in the, in the ward room there where the officers were. And I started asking questions. Well, you'd heard this code of ethics, name, rank, and serial number. That's good for twice. After that, you better say something or that's your end. And what they, what I, the first question they wanted to know was how well they had done at Pearl Harbor. Well, having been there, I knew pretty close to what they had done. And they seemed so anxious to know. I said, well, what if I exaggerate the heck out of it? So I did. I gave them, a, I'm all play everything by 10. Really, really exaggerated superficially. And they lapped it up. Every time I would answer a question, they'd give me another teaspoon of tea, because I was so dehydrated from all that salt water exposure. I was just thirstier, you, you wouldn't believe. So to get, get another spoon of tea, I'd answer a question. 
And I, well, how well have, how many of our ships have you sunk? Well, I knew it was, I divided that by three. So technically, I was giving them a 30 to 1 advantage, see, and they loved it. So I survived that day <laughs> with lots of questions and even some rice, which I soon got used to eating. And that evening, uh, they had me down in this compartment, and this interpreter came down, and he was the only one on the ship that spoke English, and he was a school teacher. And he, uh, one of the seamen came in there, and he reached way down his car and brought a little can of pineapple. And he brought a can opener out of his, out of his thing that would, would be a huge slug. Had a point on the end of it, and then uh, he'd move the cutter thing way out, anywhere along that thing. He stabbed that down the center of the can and whoosh, took the lid off like that. Had to me with some toothpicks, so I was eating this pineapple. And I was talking, the school teacher said, the captain allowed me to come down and question you, ask, you know, ask some more civil questions like, you know, like uh, where you lived and all that sort of thing. Well, by then they already knew anyway, but. So I talked to him and talked to him. And then I asked him, I said, why did you people start the war? He said, we didn't start it. Churchill and Roosevelt did. They engineered this war. Well, that got me to seriously thinking. A, B, C, D. I found out later on that a little sailing sloop called the Lanakai that was down in the Philippines was complete Navy crew was given orders to go out and hassle the Japanese and try to get the Japanese to fire the first shot at them, which they didn't do. That's quite an interesting story. Uh, two or three things happened at Pearl Harbor, too, that were kind of mysterious. Like that submarine that was sunk off of the, off of the uh, entrance there. They found that, by the way. They just found that sub here a few weeks ago. I heard that. Yeah, I've seen the pictures of it. And then a few other things that happened uh, Friday night before the, uh, Saturday night, Friday night, whatever, Friday night, yeah, before the, about 2 o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, all the alarms went off around Pearl. We didn't know what to do. We got dressed, went down the hangar, and then they blow the all clear. <clears throat> Next day, nothing was said. So obviously somebody had detected something and it sounded the alarm, but then they were told to hush up. So I still think that Churchill and Roosevelt had agreed that we would help them. But at that time, everybody was thinking peace, peace, peace. Now I want to ask you a question. At the time of Pearl Harbor, which was five minutes to eight, what time was it in Washington, D.C.? Let me think now. Probably 8 in the morning. I'm there. I can't remember if when we called that. We always called in the middle of the night or we called the other way around. What is it? Is it five hours difference? No, it's less than that. No, what time? Tell me the time it was in Washington, D.C. I can't tell you. I don't know that. <laughs> Well, anytime you see a clock in a movie that says five minutes to one is wrong. Because at that time, the time difference between the Pacific Coast and Hawaii was two and one half hours, not three hours. So anytime you see a clock that says five minutes to the hour is wrong. It had to be 25 after the hour. Okay? That's where I trap a lot of people. I trap a lot of school kids, too, because they don't know that either. See. I don't know when they changed it back to three, maybe to three hour, but it was two and a half hours at that time. And even to this day, I have a program on my computer that shows the whole world and all the countries and the times in all those different countries. And there's still a lot of countries that are on half hour time. Huh. Yeah. But particularly like down around, I forget the names of near, near India to the east, some of those countries down there are on half time still. Huh. Kind of weird, but anyway, that's a... Also, I like to ask kids, what, at the North and South Pole, what is the time basis up there? Greenwich, mean time. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
I have another quiz I give kids too. You heard of the 21 gun salute? Where did that number 21 come from? That wasn't the original colony. I don't know. Take the number 1776, add them up. Oh, wow. I don't remember that one. 21. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like to uh, throw these at the kids at school and that sort of thing. Kind of different, but a little trivia, you know, sort of thing. Well, here I was on this destroyer. They uh, questioned me off and on, and the next morning, a uh, <clears throat> Japanese seaman came in and unlocked the compartment. I was up right on the bow of this destroyer. Unlocked, and came in and said, Ohio. I said, no, I'm from California. I used that the other day when I was talking to these four or 500 people up there at McCord. And of course, everybody that laughed knew that Ohio meant good morning. <laughs> I think so that was the first word I learned in Japanese. Well, came Friday, we went into a truck, which was their equivalent of Pearl Harbor. They blindfolded me, put me on a little whale boat, and went into shore and took me up to a, a what turned out to be sort of a, it was, it was the entrance into their base there, and <clears throat> put me in, the, in a little room in the back of the guard shack. <clears throat> Well, I knew I hadn't been the first person there because somewhere on some wall, I saw a little guy had painted a, like a, with a pencil, a little like a palm tree, and put his name under it. See, so I was I knew I wasn't the first person that had been there. Well, later that day, that was Saturday, they took me up on the hills that afternoon, and that's when I thought I was really in trouble because they uh, put me down in the basement of this house. The house was very equivalent to the houses that were built in our country here at about in the 1920s with stucco outside and heavy, t regular wood timber down on a dirt floor in this basement. They were questioning me these. And they still want to know which carrier I was off of. Now, I'd been lying at first, but they'd trap me up on that because I had a piece of paper in my pocket from the Enterprise dispensary and said, USS Enterprise. I'd been lying and saying it off the Hornet. Well, see, the Hornet was sunk that day. She would got too much damage, and she went down that night. They put down, okay. But I didn't know that. So they kept asking me what ship went down. I did, and they were desperate to find out. So the two ships were so equivalent. And I didn't know what the uh, difference was until much later in being in question in, in uh, Afuna, the Navy questioning camp, that they had Jane's fighting ships records there, of course. And they showed me one ship had up right near the bow had six portholes, and the other one didn't. And I didn't know which was which. How did I, I never saw those damn portholes? <laughs> so that was one of the. So anyhow, they, boy, I tell you, they they worked me over that club pretty good that day. And I thought, man, this is this is it. Well, they got through with me then. They took me out and put me in a little tool shed, literally about three by three, locked me in there. Hard wood floors. Nothing. You couldn't lay out. You couldn't sleep. You just, and the mosquitoes about carried me away. I thought, oh, man, malaria is going to get me. But I didn't know then that the truck is the one place where malaria didn't exist, believe it or not. So next morning, a little scratch at the door. A Jap kid opens the door and hands me a bowl of rice. So I indicate, you know, like something like a fork or spoon. He says, fingers before forks. So I learned to eat my fingers. Well, a little later that, after, that morning, they took me to, back in the... Japanese uh, little small sedan, they called Jidosha, that's the Japanese name for it. Blindfold on again. I could see it a little bit down here, I could see the ground where my feet were, see, but I pretend like I didn't, so, so they wouldn't know I could see something. I came to this building, up the steps, into this room, and I knew right away, I could hear a lot of people talking in this room, and I was up against a big table, so I whip off the blindfold, and it was one of these huge big battleship tables. There must have been 30, 40, Officers there, all with lie, a lot of braids, admirals, captains, you name it. And one interpreter there. He said, Now, he said, You won't be able to pull the wool over my eyes because I went to UCRA, UCLA. Okay. He said, I want this true scuttlebutt, blah, blah, blah. So they started asking me these questions again. Same question again. How well did they do at Pearl Harbor? So I gave them the same old story again and again and again. 
Finally, I get all through, and they said, do you have any questions? I said, yes, what are we going to, when will our folks know we're still alive? Well, maybe never, because we figure you're still frontline enemy. We could take you out any time and shoot you. Besides, we're going to win this war, and we're going to march down Market Street in San Francisco. I thought to myself, that, yeah, 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 yeah. I won't say the cuss words that went through my mind, but anyway, I did. <laughs> so they put me back in this Dodosha, Japanese, kind of, took me over there, up the steps into this building, slid the door back, sliding door, and threw me in this thing. And by God, the first friendly face I saw was this kid from the squadron, the gunner. You saw the picture in his book. And in the next room, right next to us, through the closet, was the two fighter pilots. First thing they did is they got the closet. What'd you tell him? What'd you tell him? I eventually gave him an outline. Oh, good. Do you, do you know that three out of the four I was told was telling the same damn things? Amazingly. The same lies. So they thought they really had the facts straight. And later on, I read in the Nippon uh, Times, an English edition of the Nippon, where they were quoting those numbers. <laughs> Well, they put us on a, uh, I developed mastoid from all that immersion in the water. My ears started aching something horribly, and I kept complaining about it. And the, uh, uh, they used to bring us fresh water. They'd boil that water. Everything had to be boiled down there in the tropics. And they'd bring us big two-liter bottles. And they always laughed, they had a big joke to bring us that water so boiling hot we couldn't drink it, see. So I laid, us, laid alongside that thing all night with that heat right up against my. You know, the next morning I had no more headache, no more earache. But by the, the guard then had gotten worried, so he had the doctor come around. And he took a look in there and he shook his head like to say, <laughs> I said, uh oh. <laughs> but he, that, little, that doctor came around twice a day, believe it or not, and treated that ear. He'd put a bunch of that yellow picric acid where it was and put packing in there and everything. And then uh, we were there for about, uh, well, three weeks, I guess. And then they took us down and, and uh, put us on a, uh, in, a, in the hold of a, a regular NYK freighter. And they had hauled cement in there recently, so everything was full of that gray dust. We were, we were living down on the boards right down the bottom of that hold. I still had my Mae West jacket too, by the way, and I half it on <laughs> because we got shot at a couple of times by subs on our way up to Japan. But that's that one short time when the magnetic heads were not working on our torpedoes. They went under us and didn't go off. So the ship, you can see up through the hole there, you see the stars spinning around, you know, they were you know, doing evasive maneuvers and the guards come down the next morning until you know, torpedoes, all that sign language. We learn a lot of sign language in a hurry, I'll tell you. Well, I won't go into too much detail because it's going to run too much, but... Were they pretty humane at this point? Well, they're reasonable. They'd bring us down some food, what, what there was of it. And so, well, the day we came into uh, Tokyo Harbor, they had, us, they had brought us up to the upper area there where they had uh, so-called quarters. Right? Talk about quarters. Yeah, you might as well set up a closet with a couple of pillows, and that's what some of their officers were living in on that trip, for Pete's sake. I mean, they had no <laughs> no accommodations at all, so we came in there. They took us ashore in a little boat. They didn't bother to blindfold us that time, and we came to this quay, and we, we went up these steps, and we saw a white woman standing over there with a couple of small kids with her, and she was, as soon as she saw us, she made the kids look the other way. Now, I don't know what she was, maybe German. I don't know what she was. But they took us on the uh, train, like a trolley train, that went up well, maybe 10 miles or so. And we got off of there, then we had to hike about a mile or so, and through a couple of t small tunnels through these hills, finally came to this camp called Afuna, which was a Navy questioning and intimidation camp. Let me, I'm gonna switch tapes here. It's oh yeah, okay. Again.